delighted to be joined by Brendan Delaharp, who's the head of tax return service and mortgages with Corn Market. Uh, and Brendan is going to talk about the importance of inheritance planning. Uh, he's actually given this presentation to us last year to some colleagues and went down exceptionally well. So I'm really looking forward to this. What I'm going to go through today is I'm going to go through um, a, a session on the importance of having a will, why we need to have a will and why the, the use of a will is uh, vital for anyone, especially for people like who are in a superannuation scheme who have any assets. So um, really, when it comes to the will uh, and, and building a will, we're talking about things like probate and we're talking about a legal document. And a legal document is a, uh, what a will is, is a decision that you are making on how you would like your loved ones treated when it comes to your assets. So I'm going to cover the importance of making a will, how you make a will. I'm going to look at power of attorney, which personally, I believe, and the uh, Law Society in Ireland feel that should be included in a will, enduring power of attorney, and what is uh, an enduring power of attorney. And then I'm going to touch on estate planning. When you're actually structuring and building a will, you should actually think about your assets how your assets are going to be distributed on your death and the effect of tax on those assets. And really what I'm talking about here is using what are called the extended family uh, thresholds. Who, who needs a will? <laughs> My line on who needs a will on this is anyone who has any dependents. So if you have children, you're married, you're in a partnership, um, you absolutely definitely need a will. If you have any substantial asset that you own, such as a property, or you have a pension, or you have a death benefit that is paid out from your employer, you should have a will. If you have any health problems, or you're making any substantial life changes like coming up to retirement, it is a very good time to look at having a will in place. And one that a lot of people don't think about is if you're traveling abroad, you should have a will in place. And really the reason for having a will in place uh, if you're traveling abroad is it makes you appoint an executor and making having an executor appointed in the, you know, the horrific event of you passing away or, or dying while you were out of the country, it leaves that executor uh, uh, to make choices on, you know, your assets and even looking after things like paying bills and um, bring, bring your remains home into Ireland. So what happens if I don't have a will? If you don't have a will, Ireland um, and most countries have in place what are called intestate rules. And effectively, you have government legislation deciding how your assets are going to be split up. And it follows a very linear path when it comes to those. So if you um, are married, automatically everything goes to your spouse. If you're married with children, your spouse is entitled to two thirds of your estate, and then a third of your estate is divided between your children. Now, that may be all very well and good, but you know, if um, your seven, 18 or 19 or 20 year old son or daughter is receiving a portion of your assets, and in Ireland, most of the assets are in our property, it may um, leave trouble behind for your spouse. Again, these are if, there, um, if you don't leave a will in place. If you're single, then it's divided equally between um, your brothers, sisters, and your parents. And then it moves on to nieces and nephews, and then it moves on even to further relatives. And if you have no relatives of, at all, and you leave no will, the state are entitled to claim your assets or your estate. And that is if you don't have a will in place. Now, it's very unlikely that someone has absolutely no relatives at all, but they're somewhere in between those um, uh, areas that I've spoken there. And what a will is doing, it's a legal document that is actually left behind so that your loved ones can follow out through the path that you wanted to leave your assets to. And it leaves less uh, work for them to do. And it make, leaves things out very clearly. So as a legal document, a will has to comply with Irish legislation, the Family Law Act of 1995 and the Succession Act, which dates back to 1965. So legally, so legally, a will has to be compliant for it to be a valid will with those two pieces of legislation. And effectively within those two pieces of legislation, there are some formal requirements being laid out that a will has to uh, meet with. In other words, you cannot breach either the Family Law Act 
or the Succession Act, which means you can't will your spouse out of the family home, which means that you can't leave um, people destitute, um, unlike what we might watch on American TV shows where um, we can't do that in um, Ireland. We have to leave a certain amount behind to our dependents. And the other main requirement of the legislation for a valid will is that you need to be in a, a competent person when you make the will. So that means somebody who is um, you know, suffering from an illness or someone who is maybe um, you know, early onset Alzheimer's or some other areas where this, you know, mental powers are diminishing. Effectively, a will can be challenged because that person may not be a, a competent person at the time. So remember, it is a legal document and it is, has to meet certain requirements. So the um, do-it-yourself version of a will is not really the best idea. You do need to have some sort of legal advice when it comes to structuring and putting in place your will. And when it comes to building those wills, there are different types of wills. Obviously, if you're single, you have a fairly straightforward, a single person's will, and it's usually written in Ireland as a division of the assets between both your parents and your brothers, sisters, nieces, nephews, uh, friends, maybe um, uh, charities or something like that. Again, I'm going to talk about when it comes to valuing those assets and how you can reduce the liability for tax when it comes to that. But that's the same for all wills. For married people or cohabitating people, effectively, there are two wills, which is what's called a, a mirrored will. So I'm writing a will between myself and my spouse. I write the will and then it's exactly mirrored by uh, my spouse so that the assets that I'm leaving to her and to other people are mirrored in her, her will, which is the traditional way a married couple would have written a will in Ireland. More and more now we're seeing people writing mutual wills. The, the, the main advantage or disadvantage, as the case may be, of a mutual will is the will cannot be edited or changed without the other person's permission. So effectively, it means that people are making the will together. They're a married couple, civil partnership. You're agreeing on the structure of that will, and neither party can amend or change that will without the permission of the uh, spouse or um, civil partner. And effectively, that just means, you know, it's a little bit more formal in place, but probably more apt for today's circumstances with both joint assets. It's a much better structure to have in place. Um, again, when it comes to those will decisions, that's something where a legal advisor will put in place for you. If you are cohabitating, um, there is no such thing in Ireland as um, uh, a, a civil partnership, uh, sorry, as a, um, uh, in, in Ireland as cohabitating couples, where they have a recognition between the cohabitating couples, like you may have in the UK, where assets can be shared. Uh, Ireland has not yet got that system in place. So they are more complicated, especially if there are children or assets that have moved on from a previous relationship. So again, there is a specific cohabitating arrangement that solicitors can put in place or a legal advisor can put in place when it comes to building a will between people in, in those circumstances. Tax, again, is extremely important in these areas because um, of the assets split on the event of a death. I mentioned earlier about building in a power of attorney or an enduring power of attorney um, into your will. There are di two different types of power of attorney in Ireland. The first one, as I said, is the normal power of attorney. And that's where something that was used where I want somebody to do a single function over a single limited period of time for me. So I would appoint maybe a solicitor or a legal person to do this um, for me. So that would be, you know, I want to buy a property abroad. I don't want to fly abroad um, to, to, to handle all the paperwork. So I give a power of attorney to a solicitor or a lawyer in Spain or France or Italy to carry out a single transaction for me. That is power of attorney. Enduring power of attorney is something that I would build into my will or a living will, as you hear people calling them as well. And that is a section of your will that comes into play if you cannot make financial decisions for yourself through illness um, or um, 
or mental incapacity where you're not able to make sound decisions. And a doctor then will decide that you're unable to make these decisions and you are giving the authority usually to your spouse or someone um, that you trust to make financial decisions for you. And that could be as simple as paying for long-term nursing care, making sure that your uh, health insurance is paid and making decisions like that for you. They cannot make any medical decisions. They are still within the role and the power of your doctor. So this is um, not something where you're giving away all choice to someone else. It's purely to act in financial capacity. And this may be because you've an account in your own name, you've got a pension in your own name, or some form of income where you haven't actually put it in joint names or unable to put it in joint names. And it gives the spouse in most cases the example. So here I have an example of it. So, you know, Mary has appointed her husband, John, with the enduring power of attorney. So John has got to consult with Mary's family. John has got to uh, make sure that what decisions he's making on her money, her home, or any personal care are um, apt and correct for Mary. But Mary, he can't make any choices on what how Mary's um, condition or medical treatment um, is, is carried out. That is purely within the power of a doctor. Now, when it comes to an enduring power of attorney, this has to be put in place while you're of sound mind and body. You cannot do this if somebody already is suffering from an illness and the family want to you know, put in place an enduring power of attorney. So I recommend, or the law society as well recommend that this should be built in when you're actually making your will and included in a will. Very simple to do, to put in place. It, it, they can be you know, a little bit more expensive and they can maybe double the cost of putting in place a will because there's a letter that needs to be lodged with the court and there are letters that need to be signed off by doctors. So it does take a little bit longer to do. Recently, I was faced with this issue myself, with my father-in-law, you know, he was reaching into his uh, 90s still, you know, is reasonably uh, able to look after himself and all that. But again, we knew coming down the line, there could be an issue where he might have a stroke or something else like that. And we were wanted to be able to have that facility to make decisions. So an enduring power of attorney was a simple thing to add on to his will, because most older wills don't have those in place. So again, I've referenced it a couple of times when it starts to look at the value of assets and how you actually include those assets within your will. So I, for years, thought this um, uh, quote was from Mark Twain, but it's actually from Benjamin Franklin when I looked it up. So, you know, there's nothing certain except death and taxes. And unfortunately, there are a lot of taxes when we die. Capital acquisitions tax is what the revenue call this tax. And when it comes to estate planning, this is not something that is for millionaires. And the reason I say that is um, in, in 2019, which is the last year I can get full figures from revenue for, revenue collected almost 500 million or half a billion in local property tax in Ireland. In that same period, they collected nearly 600 million in capital acquisitions tax or inheritance tax, which is what um, we call capital acquisitions tax. And when I looked uh, and dug into it a little bit deeper, the average tax take is less than €100,000 when it comes to this inheritance tax, which to me means that they're collecting this tax from normal size estates. They are not taking this tax from millionaires or multimillionaires. And the reason for that is because they get very good tax advice and they have structured their assets in such a way that the government are not getting a lot of capital acquisitions tax. And it's important to remember in Ireland, if you're a resident domiciled in Ireland, that the estate uh, tax or capital acquisitions tax is at 33% above any thresholds that are available. So what I'm going to talk about is using those thresholds. So when it comes to probate and when it comes to um, looking at capital acquisitions tax, everything you have accumulated within your lifetime is counted. So houses, property, investments, personal items, cars, jewellery, you know, 
stamp collections, wine collections, whatever it is that you have put along through the years. And obviously your uh, remains of any pension fund that is out there are included as your assets. And while you are allowed to will whatever assets you want, above certain thresholds, the revenue are going to tax them. So it's important when you're looking at your will, which is leaving instructions behind and how you want your assets distributed, you also take into account what your loved ones are going to receive and will they be under or over any thresholds that are there. So when it comes to the thresholds, it's important to remember that there are four thresholds. We can will to our spouse, civil partner, anything we like, and there is no tax. So our spouse is exempt when it comes from tax. That is not a cohabitating uh, partner that is married. Our children in their lifetime one child in their lifetime can recede up to a maximum of €335,000 as an inheritance. And if they have received, you know, help to buy a house earlier, you've, you've given them fifty grand, or they've got money from um, either yourself or your spouse, that is minus off the lifetime uh, threshold of 335000 Linean ancestors or descendants, parents, brothers, sisters, nieces, nephews can inherit a maximum of 32,500 euros and everyone else is 16,250 euros. Charities, of course, can receive gifts um, with no tax as well on them. So I'm going to hazard a guess here that any of you who have put in a will have got your will structured in such a way. If I die, my spouse receives everything. If my spouse is dead before me, it goes to me. And then the last one of us to die, everything is divided equally among children. And that's the reason, and I'm going to give you an example here, why people are paying tax, uh, inheritance tax. So this is an example I dealt with a number of years ago in North County, Dublin. The, um, client, the person who had passed away had left their estate to their two daughters. And their estate comprised of the family home, which is valued at a half million, they had bought an investment property in Galway because the two girls had gone to college in Galway, the two daughters. Um, the, the, the person who passed away was a retired uh, principal. Um, they had some of their gratuity left, 100,000 euros. And then they had assets, cars, jewellery, bits and pieces left over that came to another 68,000 euros. Their total accumulated assets that themselves and their spouse had built up through their working or income generating career was 878,000 euros. And this lady did not view herself as a million, uh, millionaire, obviously. Um, and she didn't res uh, view herself as someone who needed to have, you know, estate tax planning or capital acquisitions tax planning. So how did revenue deal with the estate? She divided her estate equally between her two children. Um, uh, on the next slide, you can see that. And revenue then were taxed the excess above the two gifts to the children of 335,000. It's 208,000 of an excess. So 68,640 euros was due in capital acquisitions tax. So that probably meant that the girls had to sell the house or um, uh, uh, some way to find the money to pay the 68,000 euros split between the two of them. And I knew one of the daughters and she had said to me, Brendan, how could mum have, have written her will that we didn't have this tax bill or was it possible to do that? And how can we structure our wills that this won't happen? So what I did was I gave this example of how the will could have been structured. She could have included the grandchildren and the spouse as the sons-in-law in the will. So the grandchildren could have been left 32 and a half thousand euros each. So that's four grandchildren, 130,000 euros. Now, she could have structured her will in such a way that the grandchildren didn't obviously receive the gift until they were or the inheritance, until they were 19, 20, 21, whatever age she chose, or maybe when they needed to buy a house or something else like that. And it could have been locked away. But she could have gifted that 130,000 or left it as an inheritance, and that would have reduced the scope for tax. The sons-in-law are regarded as strangers, so that's €16,250 each they could have received. 
that would have left an estate behind that was only taxed at 45,000 euros, which is revenue getting 15,000 euros of tax. To me, that makes total and complete sense. And all it was were small changes when the will was being structured or an amendment to a will to effectively bring into play um, a, a more efficient distribution of the assets within the will. Along with this, there are other ways you can um, reduce the assets in a will. So um, Section 72s are used, they're an insurance policy that are used in very large estates. And these are effectively an insurance policy that is calculated to pay out the amount of tax that's due. And generally, the estate are using the premium of the Section 72 to reduce the assets. But they're only really used in very substantial estates. There is a thing called the small gift exemption. We are all allowed to gift up to 3,000 euros per year to any individual we want, and that has no tax implications. So you can effectively plan out to be maybe putting aside money in a savings policy or gifting money to sons and daughters that will not have any impact on inheritance tax. And the example I use is you may have a son or a daughter who are getting close to getting married and you'd like to help them out on the wedding costs. If you hand them over a check for you know, 15,000 euros, that is, accum that is taken off the 335,000 as the lifetime exemption. But prior to Christmas, if your son or daughter call over to the house and you give them 3,000 euros, and your spouse gives them 3,000 euros, and then they call back after Christmas and you give them an after the new year and they give them another three grand each, they're small gift exemptions, no tax implications. And if you want to double it, you can also make the same gift to the uh, fiance or uh, the other half who they're getting married to, and you can double the amount and bring it up to. Um, from, from 12,000 between now and the new year up to 24,000. Again, totally legal using the small gift exemption. You um, don't have any issue where that is accumulated up into the uh, 335,000 threshold. And we see a lot of people using these as regular savings plans, where they will maybe save for a son or daughter, putting three grand aside each year, small gift exemption, and building up a pot of money that can be used to help out with um, you know, a deposit for house or something like that in the future, no tax implications. The last three of these are used in specific circumstances, the dwelling house exemption, business relief and agriculture relief. And there are a number of um, criteria that need to be met before someone can use it. So don't try and set these up yourself get financial and tax advice on how business relief, agriculture relief, and obviously the dwelling house exemption apply, and they may reduce tax bills in the future. So to sum up, when it comes to um, thinking about wills, always think about the assets that are going to be left behind, because these assets may be liable for tax. Make the most of the extended family thresholds that are there, and then structure your will. Don't do it the other way around. Don't write your will and then start maybe in years to come to think about what are the assets that are there. Think about it in a holistic way because that will make decisions on how you're going to allocate it and it will actually mean that revenue are going to get less in the long run.